Hey, good morning, guys. How you doing? So glad you're here. You glad to be here? Hey, my name is Drake. I'm the pastor of City Church in Boulder, Colorado. If you don't know this, you guys have been instrumental in helping us plant City Church. City Church is officially four years old. We survived COVID, still there. We're seeing all kinds of amazing things happen, and it's because of your, your radical generosity financially and through prayers that we've seen God do some amazing, amazing things. In just a few weeks, at the end of this month, one of my good friends, his name is Dan, Met him right early on. We used to, before we ever even started our gatherings, we would like throw these parties at local bars. Super cool. And, and uh, when we would get there, we would do these free drink tickets. We had like drinks on the house. It's called a community night. And we like start to call interest parties and like, hey, we're starting a new church. You should come check it out. And like no one in Boulder wakes up in the morning saying I'm going to go to church, right? So like the majority of our population is disconnected from following Jesus. And so we're like, all right, how do we meet people where they are? Let's start at the bars. Let's go. So... That's where we hung out. I met Dan there. It's actually after the event was over, we took a bunch of drink tickets, passed them out at the end, like a bunch of leftovers. We're like, hey, here's a free drink on the house. And they were like, what the what? <laughs> Any church that'll buy me a beer, I got to go check out. That's what they said. And so he wasn't a Christian. In fact, he was a hard, hard atheist. He's a scientist at CU Boulder, an incredible guy. His wife uh, was, a, or really, not wife then, but his wife now was a Christian. And so they're kind of in that space. So start meeting with Dan, incredible friend, have known him for years. We would meet regularly as he started to plug in. He's like, I love City Church. We're talking about Jesus, all of those things. And then over and over again, Dan's like, man, I don't know. I love everything about this church. I love Jesus. I love the idea of Jesus. I just cannot figure out this, this resurrection thing, right? He's like, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. Can't, can't get over that hill. And I'm like, all right, God, how are you ever going to do this? Earlier this year... He and his wife are at a Hillsong conference in Denver, and he has an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and the dude gives his life to Jesus, and he's getting baptized at the end of this month. Let's go. Um, that's, that's four years of, of just being faithful to the process, and I think it's important that you remember, like, God defines success differently than we do. And so faithfulness to the process is really only our call. We, we talk about planting in Boulder. It's like someone telling you, to, like giving you a seed and telling you to walk out in the middle of the, of the highway right over here and like break up the concrete and plant that seed. That's what it's like planting City Church in Boulder. And so it's been a joy to watch God do only what he can do. And I just want you to know you're a part of every story that God has been rewriting. And so thank you. Put your hands together for God's goodness. Um, also, can we just put our hands together for the band and the production team leading us in worship this morning? Crushed it. So good. Also, all of our volunteers, man, your greeters, all your, all your kids' workers, they're heroes, right? Put your hands together for them. Amazing. I love, I love Rev Church. I love the humility. I love the servant leadership. I love the culture you guys are building. I love what God is doing. And I'm so grateful to be here today to share with you. Uh, I've been praying over you and I've been kind of watching what God's doing in this community. And so I really feel like today God has something special for us. And so I just want to invite you to lean in. I want to pray for us real fast and then we'll get into uh, the message. So Holy Spirit, thank you so much for being here. I mean, we lean on the promises in scripture that where two or three are gathered, you're there. And so we know, we, we don't have to ask you to come. You're already here. You're in us individually as followers of Jesus, but you're also here in this room with us. And so we invite you, Holy Spirit, we want to invite your manifest presence to be with us, to work in hearts and minds, to show up that we would experience you. We don't, we, we don't hinge our faith on experiences and feelings, but we know that you are a God that can meet us in that place. And so we just invite you to do what you want. It's your will. It's your kingdom. Any of our friends that are not followers of you today, maybe they're wrestling with faith, they're wrestling with what it means to be a part of, of, of a local church or community, I pray that you meet them right where they are. Let them know how incredibly loved they are and, and what they're invited into. I pray for those of us that are following you, no matter where we are today, man, would you draw us close to your heart, fill us with your spirit and your power. And would, not, would you not only change our hearts and minds today, but would you then move us as we go out into the world around us to continue to share your love with the surrounding city, friends, family, coworkers. As the Holy Spirit, as we invite you here, we also silence every voice in the name of Jesus that takes away from you. We, we wanna silence distractions, the voices of depression, of discouragement, of loneliness, of guilt, of shame. Any voice that takes away from you in the name of Jesus, we command to be silent. We only want to hear from you today. That's why we're here. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you guys again for being here. It's an honor. Um, you ever been really, really thirsty? 
Anybody, right? Like the last couple of weeks in Texas, you know, just every day, 108 degrees outside, whatever. Except for today, it's kind of a nice little deluge that'll leave us with humidity. Just want you to know, I live in Boulder and it's like a nice 75 degrees and beautiful, all, like it's just awesome. So coming here is a real sacrifice, I want you to know. Like I love you guys a lot, okay? Randy's like, will you get on a plane and leave beautiful Boulder, Colorado to come to sweaty Texas? And I'm like, you bet I will. You bet I will. It's, it's not Houston, so it's, at least it's not Houston. Anyway. You ever been, you ever been, you ever been really thirsty? Like really thirsty, like, like dying on the inside thirsty? So when we moved to Boulder, this is Mount Sanitas. This is, I live like right, right over here. Um, and this is one of the many mountains on the foothills where we are. And um, we're, we're at like 5,600 feet in elevation. So we're way closer to the sun than you are. Um, and so it's not as hot, but we're closer to the sun. And so like that sun on your skin, it's like fire. <laughs> and so I joke a lot with our friends. We're like, hey, in Texas, you know, it's like 108 outside and you get in the shade under a tree and it's 108 under that tree too, right? Like, so it's not really, in, in Boulder, it's, you know, it can be 90 outside, but you get under a tree and it's 75 under that tree. It makes a difference. And so being in the sun, direct exposure, no clouds, like that can be pretty, pretty uh, heavy. And especially like the elevation, hydration is really important. A lot of people come and visit us and they don't drink a lot of water. And so then they get elevation sickness and it's a whole thing. So if you come to Boulder, drink lots of water. Um, but we, we got to Boulder and we, we had our family. Our kids are young. We got some staff members and some other friends. So we've got like five or six kids with us and then another six adults. And we're going to go hike this Mount Sanitas loop. And it's like two, two hours of a hike and it's moderate. Like it's, it's relative. On the back side here, you can't really see it very well, but it's like really rigid trail down. And that's called the stair stepper. And so it's a pretty brutal way down. So you, you can either go up the stair stepper or make the loop down. And so we had all of our kids there. I mean, they're like one and three and five and seven. I mean, little kids. And so we all brand new to Boulder and it's like a two hour hike, like you know, if you're in shape and you live there. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, you know, if you're new, it's, it's what well, we were hoping it was a two-hour hike. It was not, let it be known. And so we start out, and it's on this trail, and there's not a tree to be seen on this trail. It's a, we're like, hey, we'll start on the gradual side, let everybody kind of work up, and then come down the stair stepper because gravity can do some work for us. It was a really great idea. And so we get rolling, except the sun is out, there's not a cloud in the sky, and there are no trees to be found, and we are just cooking in this sun. It's the middle of summer, and so it is smoking hot. It's not in the hundreds like here, but it's like, right, it's that different heat. And so we got our water bottles and stuff, and we, you know, eventually are carrying kids, and it's, it's like herding cats to get up this mountain, right? Like, all these little kids, they stop at every grasshopper that they find, you know what I mean? Like, it's, so we're finally, and we go all the way around, we get up this ridge, it kind of switchbacks a bunch to all the way up to here, and we get up there, and we, re we have a very, like, kind of scary moment. We get to the top, and we realized we have zero water left. Like everybody brought, brought a bottle, but we got kids and all, and so we have no water and we just made it to the top. And, we're, and, and, and like we would have drank a lot of water at the top if we had it, but it's gone, right? So we needed a lot more in our bodies. We're like, all right, what do we do with the rations here? Do we, do, do we give it to our kids? You know, on an airplane, they're like, put your mask on and then your kids, what do you do with water, right? Like, <laughs> which one goes first? And then are we gonna have to like pee in a bottle and like through a sock and is that where we are, 127 hours? <laughs> What's going to happen? We don't know. And then who goes first? You know what I mean? It's, it's scary. And so we're like, oh, I got to keep our kids alive. Like, which one of those are the most, you know, so the one-year-old, oh, we got to help him out. But then the three-year-old, maybe we can leave him up here and he can survive for a day while we go get help. I don't know what we're going to do. And so then with no water left, we're like, well, we got to get off this mountain and we got to take care of these kids and ourselves. And so then the kids are exhausted. We're all exhausted. And, the, you know, the progressive, a one-year-old is not that hard to carry, but like a seven-year-old, <laughs> you're like, dog. Use your own feet. And so you're carrying all these kids down, and they're huge, right? I mean, I mean, it's like giant boulders that you're stepping off of. It's not nice stairs at all. And so it's like killing your knees. And so at one point, like your, your goal is just to get it down the mountain, not drop a, a child or fall with them while you're carrying them, you know, not kill anybody. If somebody rolls their ankle on the way down. We're like, well, that sucks. I'm not carrying you. You're out of luck. Like, you go sit under that tree over there. We'll be back for you. Um, and, and so it's, it's like a rough trip down. And like, you ever get to the place where you're just kind of so exhausted and so, like you're not even there like it's just like a, a blur and so we're kind of just falling down this mountain is what it feels like and then we get back to the bottom and there's a creek running through it and so then immediately we just like go sit in this creek like just to like cool our bodies off but like you don't you don't drink straight out of the creek like yes mountain fresh but it hasn't been filtered yet and you don't know what animals like downstream doing its business you know so like you just don't you don't drink right out of the river right and so get some one of those brain amoebas or something so anyway we get in it but we don't drink the water 
and we're nowhere near anything access-wise to water. And so we get off the mountain and we're exhausted and we like fumble back home to get water and we're like, never again. <laughs> that was ridiculous. It took us like four hours and we're now down one staff member. We haven't seen them since. It's terrible. So that's a joke. Uh, anyway, so it was a lot. And I, I don't know if you've ever been that thirsty, but like it was, it was like a, I'm not all there thirsty. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's not the only time I've been thirsty. Right, there are other times that I have been thirsty in different ways, right? And so I'm looking for satisfaction or pleasure or progress or appreciation or significance or success or whatever. And, and there's all these different things. Maybe it's just distraction and moving into oblivion so I don't have to think about life. There's all kinds of different ways that I have had thirsts in my life that I'm trying to satisfy. The problem is they're not always as evident. Or sometimes I try to take drinks from different places and they kind of quench the thirst for a minute, but then I'm right back to it. You ever been there? You ever been thirsty? You see, in our world, we have this thirst on the inside, whether you're, you know, single or uh, in elementary school or you're, you know, young, married with kids or you're a business, business professional. We all have all these different stages of life and we have different hungers and thirsts that come our way. Relationships and careers and money and pleasure and possessions and experiences. In, in Boulder, rather than the American dream looking like a big house and a yard and you know five kids and a dog or whatever dream it is today, it's all about experiences, mainly because um, you can't afford a house, so you might as well just use your money elsewhere. And so it's all about how many experiences we can have, and, and that's living the pinnacle of the best life, right? It's popularity, it's significance, it's autonomy. It's just, man, I, I'm, I'm thirsty to be my own boss or to, to not have someone over me all the time. Whatever it is, there's a thirst that you and I are constantly trying to fill. Have you guys, anybody uh, been exposed to the new Threads app that just came out, anybody? Anybody got Threads downloaded on their phone? One, anybody else? Two, wow, I'm so proud, three, let's go. Okay, a couple of them. The first service, nobody, nobody, which is great. You guys are not a st statistic, so listen, what I'm about to tell you, don't let it suck you in, okay? Don't let it suck you in. This is just for your information. You don't have to download it. All right, so this week, this last week, a new app came out launched by Meta called Threads, which is like their version of Twitter. So they're like fighting Elon Musk over there and it's cool. So the time that it took for platforms to reach 1 million users is just kind of a graph. Twitter took two years, Facebook 10 months, Instagram 2.5 months, ChatGPT, I have no idea what that is, but apparently it has a million you know, users, so that's cool, go them. And then Threads launched last week and it took one to two hours for them to hit 1 million downloads. A week later, they have over 30 million users. It is the fastest app use and download to date that our nation has ever seen, and it's wild. And Zuckerberg's like, sweet, you know, it's, it's a cool, it's a cool thing. What's interesting is all of these social media platforms, one of the things I was thinking about last week is like, what's the deal? Like, like why, why was there this crazy rush toward the social media platform? Like, where, where does that come from? And I think it's because one of the lures, one of the promises of social media is come take a drink. Are you thirsty? Come take a drink. You, you want to forget how much your life sucks? Go look at somebody else's. Or you want to re realize like your life is better than other people? Then go watch some fail videos. You know what I mean? Like, and it's like, come take a drink. Come take a drink. Come take a drink. Post a picture. Get some likes. Come take a drink. Come take a drink. And over and over again, the lure of social media is disappear into this platform and be refreshed. And you kind of just distract into oblivion, right? It's, it's a pretty normal thing. Here's what's crazy. Listen to this. Average American social media use to this day, right now, is two and a half hours a day. The average use of American social media platforms is two and a half hours a day per person. Then you bump that up, the, the average phone use is five hours a day. The average American is on their phone five hours a day. And then you bump that, up, bump that up one more time, and the average American exposure to screen time, so this includes TV and work, if you're on screens there, whatever, the average American screen time total, including all of it, is seven and a half hours a day. How long are you awake? <laughs> About eight, <laughs> maybe 10? This is wild, seven and a half hours a day, you and I are, are, are being pulled into a space that says, hey, you thirsty? right here. And it does. What does it do? 
in the moment. Bam, you're getting little dopamine hits, little quench of thirst, right? You're at dinner with your family. You pick up your phone instead of being present to them. And you're, and you're trying to be quiet alone with Jesus and you pick up your phone and you check an email or you check another, right? Over and over again, it's constant in our lives. So, are you thirsty? How's your soul? Are you thirsty for change? Are you, are, you, are you thirsty for formation? Are you thirsty for a new narrative in your life? Are you looking at what's in front of you and just frustrated with it? Are, are you thirsty for something more? Are you thirsty? Are, 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 are you frustrated with life? Are, do you feel stuck in your spiritual journey? Are you distracting yourself into oblivion? Are you exhausted? Are you lonely? Are you defeated? Are you frustrated? Are you lost? Are you confused? Are you without direction? Because you're not alone. You're not alone in any of that. And if you're not those things, then maybe you're filling your thirst with some of those other places, but you and I both know that some of those things are short-lived, aren't they? And career only takes me so far, and a relationship only takes me so far, and possessions only take me so far, and, and, and pleasure only takes me so far. Are you thirsty? Uh, the philosopher James K.A. Smith would say it this way. He says that you and I, we are what we want. We are what we want, meaning our thirsts, our loves, our longings, our hungers, they are shaping us. You and I are being formed every day. The person that you are and the person you're becoming, it's not static. Every day you are being formed, and some of it is intentional and most of it is not. All you have to do to be formed tomorrow is to wake up, and the world will do the work for you. And the people around you will do the work for you. The community around you will do the work for you. Some of it is intentional. You being here this morning, it's intentional. This is you choosing to be formed on purpose. You see, Jesus has an invitation for all of us to be formed on purpose, to become people of love, to become people who not only can receive the love of God, which is one of the biggest hurdles for our hearts and minds, is just to, to realize that God, God loves us and to actually receive that, and then to give the love of God. Jesus said in John 15, he says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. And I think one of the ways that we, ways that we hear that, if you're like me, you hear it, and it kind of sounds like Jesus is saying, you better obey me if you love me. You guys hear that? Like one of the ways you show that you love me is by obeying me, you follow me. That's not what Jesus is saying. If you love me, relationship, the byproduct, the fruit, is you will obey my commands. It's not a have to, it's a get to. You guys see the difference? That's the invitation from Jesus. All of us are being formed to receive and to give the love of God, to become people of love. So listen to Jesus' words here in John 7. On the last day of the feast, this is the Feast of Booths. You can go check out this on your own time. This is like a giant party in Jerusalem. It's like a giant camping party. But there's no REI, so it's not like near as glamorous as maybe it is in my hood. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got a nice truck camper, and we go out, and, and it's awesome. Not this, no. It's sweaty, and there's a bunch of people. It's a lot. Last day of the Feast of Booths, the great day, Jesus stood up, and he cried out, If anyone thirsts, they live in the desert. <laughs> Like, thirst is a way of life. If anyone's thirsty, <laughs> present, me, check. Let him come to me and drink. This is wild. Okay, the, the, the whole point of the Feast of Booths is they're remembering God, God's promises. That he, There's promises in the Old Testament. He said, I'm going to pour out my spirit like water on all flesh. It's going to bring new life to everyone. And so there's all these ceremonies during this feast. They would carry water up to Jerusalem, dump it on the altar as a picture of one day God pouring out his spirit. And so then Jesus shows up and he says, it's right here. If you're thirsty, come to me. And drink. Whoever believes in me, and that's just not, that's not like cognitive rearrangement of your, your thoughts. This is not like move the mental furniture around in your mind and cool, check, I believe some right things about Jesus, therefore everything is good. This is trusting in the person, the character, the nature of Jesus, who he says he is, the, the reality that he's inviting us into. So believe is not just mental assent. It's really important that you, got, you guys catch that. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have, have said, out of his heart, will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. 
And so this is an amazing moment. Jesus says, are you thirsty? And the answer is yes. Physically, yes. Spiritually, yes. Relationally, yes. Emotionally, yes. I'm thirsty, and I'm trying to figure this thing out, and it, nothing is working. And he says, come to me and drink, and you will be satisfied in a way that you never thought possible like rivers of living water that fill you in such a way that it never stops and it flows out of you. We have these creeks that run through Boulder in multiple different areas, and when the snow melt happens, I mean, they come crushing down, and they are moving, and it's tons of water, but even in the winter, the water never stops, and it's always fresh, and it's always ice cold, and that's where we're baptizing Dan next week, which is awesome. We baptize people in the creek so they never forget it, right? <laughs> We're like, this you will never forget. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's memorable. Um, Jesus says, come to me. If you're thirsty, come to me. So, again, the question, very simply today, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Because, listen, if we're honest, like, you don't have to be honest, but I'll be honest, okay? If we're honest, if I'm honest, I've been following Jesus for almost two decades. I, I gave my life to Jesus at 15, he changed my life. And here's the deal, guys. I was looking for, like, significance and success and pleasure, all the things in life. I'm chasing them everywhere, trying to fill this thirst. And then I meet Jesus, and it turns out everything I was looking for, I found in him. And he changed my life. And there was this river of living water. Quite, I mean, man, it's amazing what he did. And since then, I've been following Jesus for almost two decades. And in some ways, he has changed everything and continues to change everything. You guys with me on that? You feel that? And, and other times, I still find myself thirsty. Can I say that at church? Yeah. I'm still thirsty. And listen, it's not, not, like, not like Jesus wasn't enough. I don't want you to misunderstand me. But more like there's more to Jesus than I have. Like, the, the, I, I'm missing something, not because it's not available, but because I'm not taking advantage of it. It's like if you're uh, downtown Pearl Street in Boulder, which is kind of our, like, mall strip, kind of cool tourist spot, and Bill Gates is down there, or let's use I mean, some Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk, whoever, somebody with a big checkbook, right? And they're handing out $100 bills to everyone that walks by because that's what they do. And then you walk up to them, and then they just see something really special in you. They're just like, Wow. This guy right here, this lady right here. And instead of giving you a $100 bill, they pull out their checkbook and they sign it and they hand you a blank check. Sweet. We, we're building a new building, baby. Let's go. And while you're at it, help us buy our building, okay? While, while we're doing it. And you get a blank check. And I want you to imagine you have this blank check from Elon Musk or whoever and you stick it in your wallet, you stick it in your purse, and you live the rest of your life with that check on your person at all times. In theory, you are one of the most wealthiest persons on the planet at that point, aren't you? You have access to unbelievable amounts of riches and resource, don't you? But I want you to imagine that you never cash that check. You leave it in your purse, your wallet, for the rest of your life. That functionally, you never tapped into what was available to you. I think a lot of people follow Jesus that way. Jesus wrote a check with his life and you and I, we receive it, and it is access to an incredible life of power and freedom and, and, and all the things that God wants us to do, and we stick that check in our wallet, and we just go on living our lives. Thanks, Jesus, for saving me. I'll see you in heaven. And then you have all these followers of Jesus who live powerless lives, defeated lives, distracted lives, lives without joy, lives that are languishing. You say, how do we get there? It's because we let our thirst be satisfied in other short-term places rather than in Jesus. But he has so much more for us. So what I want to help you do today is I want to help you cash that check. You guys with me? Yeah. Jesus wrote a check with this life, and it's available to you. And so there's a nagging sense sometimes in the back of my mind that there's got to be more. Like, like there's got to be more than going to church and, and being in a small group and serving others and becoming more emotionally healthy. Like, those are good things, right? But then when I, I read the scriptures and I look at my life, you ever feel like there's just a disconnect of what, what's happening in the scriptures or even what Jesus promises you and then what you're experiencing? Like, why, why is there a disconnect? That's what we're going to talk about today. Because that gap is, is not because it's not available to us. Listen to Billy Graham here. Everywhere I go, he said, I find that God's people lack something. There it is. They are hungry for something. Their Christian experience is not all that they expected, and they often have recurring defeat in their lives. 
Christians today are hungry for spiritual fulfillment. The most desperate need of the nation today is that men and women who profess Jesus would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, rivers of living water are available. Come and drink. And John tells us that he said this about the Holy Spirit. Now, I've been watching from the outside, and it's really cool to watch how Rev Church is kind of pressing into all that the Spirit has for you as a community. I love it. Now, listen, depending on where you are, I don't know where you're walking in. Some of you are brand new to church or brand new to following Jesus or kind of checking things out from the outside. And as soon as we start, start talking about the Holy Spirit, you're like, what the heck are we talking about? Like, what, what is that? Some of you, when you hear conversations around the Holy Spirit, you start to break out in hives. You're like Im- immediately allergic to that conversation. You're like, oh my goodness, I got to go find another church. And some of you are like, finally, yes, next week I'm bringing my tambourine and my flags and we are getting it. Let's go. I don't know where you are on, on that spectrum. Um, wherever you are, here's, here's what I think is happening here in this community is you are a people hungry for more of what God wants to do. I think it's a perfect place to be. So I came to faith um, at 15 in a small church in Fort Worth. And the first thing I learned to do was like read the scriptures and like listen to God and pray and like some of those basic spiritual disciplines. And it was beautiful. It was so helpful. Someone helped me to like start spending time with God and hear the voice of God and begin to like submit my life and follow him and reshape my mind with truth. It was great. But... While, while we've done a good job as a church in Boulder of keeping like, the scriptures kind of central, I feel like there's more that we see in scripture than we were experiencing. And so we've been on this journey as a church of just pressing into the scriptures and, and who the Holy Spirit is and what he wants to do in our lives. And I feel like you guys are on a similar journey. And so I just want to speak to you a little bit about that today. So the question very simply before we get going, kind of before we land the plane, is who is the Holy Spirit? So we've got to start there, right? Like, what are we talking about when we talk about the Holy Spirit? Now, the Holy Spirit... As Jesus followers, we believe that God exists as as what theologians call a triune God. He's the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I don't have the time nor the capacity to explain that to you well, but if you want a really solid explanation of the Trinity, I recommend that you go to our friends at The Bible Project. You can get that on YouTube or on the website. They're incredible. They do illustrated videos if you haven't picked it up. And they do two videos. One is called God and one is on the Holy Spirit. I believe that Rev is going to post those on your social media platforms for you. I highly recommend that you go check those. You got seven minutes, not right now, but, you know, later. Seven minutes, man, go check it out. It is amazing, and it really helps capture some of the things we can't cover today. So just when it comes to conversations around the Holy Spirit, if you want to find out more, I highly recommend you check those two videos out, God and the Holy Spirit. And then in addition, at City Church, we did a 12-week series last fall on the Holy Spirit, kind of walking through this as a church together. And so it's on our podcast, it's on our YouTube channel, it's all on our website. And so if we can serve you in any way that's helpful, if you find yourself leaning in and hungry for more and wanting to dig into not just who the Holy Spirit is, but all the stuff the Spirit does, then I'd recommend that resource to you as well. Now, let's go to Jesus for a second. John 16. Now, John 14, 15, and 16, you can read it on your own time. This is kind of Jesus' discourse with his disciples before he goes to the cross, kind of downloading some really important stuff on them. And this is just one snapshot. So all of it on your own time would be helpful. But John 16, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Now, hold on. Hit the brakes. Can you imagine, right, you're living life with Jesus. You're convinced he's like the son of God and he's done, I mean, you watched all of it, right? Turned a Long John Silver's box into like 5,000 loaves and fishes and like, I mean, he's healed, you know, some, uh, people from the dead and he, he, you know, blind have been healed and the lame are walking and, right? I mean, amazing. He's walking on water, you're like a little jet skiing with Jesus. Like, I mean, it's amazing. And so then Jesus says, hey, it's to your advantage that I leave you. What? What could possibly be better than Jesus, you being right here? Can you imagine tomorrow, whatever your day, you wake up in the morning and you're exhausted because you stayed up too late. And so now you're you're dealing with kids and you got to get ready for work or whatever you're doing. And Jesus is there with you. That first cup of coffee. He's like, hey, you ready to spend some time with me? You're like, you bet I am. Let's go. You're here. And And then your kids wake up and they're having issues. And you're like, how do I respond to my kids? Jesus is right there. And so rather than throttling them with irritation, you're like, oh, I'm going to respond like Jesus would because he's right. Hey, Jesus, how do I, what should I say? And you got those moments. And then at work, someone comes up to you and someone's complaining about your boss. And you would love to complain with them because all the things they're saying are true. But Jesus is right there. And you're like, yeah, we don't, 
We don't do that. Like, we don't, we don't gossip, do we, Jesus? No, we don't. No, we, we honor people. That's what we do with our words. We build them up. Um, and, and, right, and you have all these moments where you get home and you're exhausted and then you would have come in and maybe you had a moment where there's going to be conflict with your spouse because you, you, you weren't on your A game and they needed a word of encouragement from you, but instead you're grumpy and picky. And instead you walk in and then Jesus helps you give them words of encouragement. Can you imagine if Jesus is with you all day? That'd be helpful, wouldn't it? It'd be pretty sweet. What in the world could be better than that? And Jesus says, if I don't go away, the helper or the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The only thing better than Jesus next to you is Jesus in you. And Jesus, I don't want you to miss this, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as a person. I will send him to you. You notice the pronoun? Here's what's interesting. Half, I believe it was a study done by Barna, half of Americans that are followers of Jesus think that the Holy Spirit is a force, not a person. When we're talking about the Holy Spirit, their minds immediately go to a force, like a power that you summon or experience, not a person that you have a relationship with. See, when you read the scriptures, right, Paul would say, hey, don't grieve the Spirit, as in a person with emotions that you can be in relationship with. Or Paul would say, walk with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. As in, you could walk ahead of the Spirit or behind the Spirit. But he said, walk with the Spirit. You guys, with that, like, you see? It's a relationship, but half of Americans surveyed said that they think the Holy Spirit is a force, like Star Wars. And so my brother just got this really cool tattoo on his arm, Star Wars, got both sides. I'm digging it. It's really cool. I think a lot of people, right, they, they, when they think about the Holy Spirit, they're like, oh, the force is strong with this one, right? Like there's a few people that the force is strong with, like the elite few. Like, and you know who it is because anytime you have something come up that you need prayer over, you're like, oh man, we need to have them pray for that, right? Because when they pray, like, they have this special connection with God and the Holy Spirit. And like a few, select few get to be Jedi Knights, you know what I mean, the Holy Spirit. And I think a lot of people think about the Holy Spirit in that way. And this is thinking that, that the Holy Spirit is a power that we wield or access rather than a person that we have a relationship with. And how we think about this massively affects how we experience the power of God in our life, how that thirst is satisfied. Listen to Gordon Fee here. Through Christ and by the Spirit, we are being transformed. Through Christ and by the Spirit. You guys see that? We are being transformed so as to bear the likeness for which we were intended at the beginning. One takes the Spirit lightly in Pauline theology and Christian experience at great risk when we don't consider the Holy Spirit in his role. For herein lies the glory that by the Spirit we not only come to know God, which is great, but we also come to live in his presence in such a way as to constantly be renewed into God's image. The Spirit is the one that we partner with, that we work with in relationship to be formed, to become a people of love. But if it's a force, then one of the questions that comes up is, how do I get more of the Spirit? You ever heard that? Like, how do I get more of the Spirit? Fill, fill me. We have all these languages. How do I get more of it? Well, that makes sense if it's a thing that you attain or get more of, but how do you get more of a relationship that you already have? I want you to imagine my wife and I, we've been married for, uh, it'll be 13 years this October. Woo! 13 years. She hasn't left me yet. Let's go. And 13 years, we, we, we'll be married in October. And I want you to imagine on our wedding day, I was 21, she was 19. And I want you to imagine I came up with my own vows that day. And I want you to uh, just imagine it sounded something like this. Hey, babe, you got the rings, doing the vows. Now that I've got you, I, I just want you to know that this is probably the best it's ever gonna be right here. This is the pinnacle of intimacy right now. I mean, this is it, babe. So take it all in. And listen, I'm, I'm so looking forward to life together. I'm so glad that you came into my life and I cannot wait to see you on Sundays, sometimes. Unless there's a game on or I'm camping. But most Sundays, I'll see you. Oh, and at meals, at, listen, at meals, I'll talk to you, and I'll, I'll say thanks for things, and, you know, if I need something, I'll definitely hit you up. Like, anytime I need something, girl, I, I am calling you up. But other than that, you know, like, I need my, like, I'll see you around. I wouldn't be married 
if that was the way that our vows went down, right? That's ridiculous, and you know that. But that's how a lot of people treat their relationship with God. Jesus, I'm so glad you're in my life. Thanks so much for what you did. I'll see you around. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are pretty much the same old grind by ourselves, not giving much thought, distracting ourselves into oblivion, trying to do marriage on our own, parenting on our own, dating on our own, college on our own, elementary school on our own, just high school relationships, trying to do finances on our own, trying to beat habits on our own, trying to be formed on our own over and over again. And then we look up and we come back. Hey, it's Sunday. Good to see you again. Can you help a brother out? Let's go. A little formation right now would be awesome. But that's not how our relationship works, is it? A relationship is built through intimacy. And you and I both know that love is spelt in a relationship, T-I-M-E. It takes time. Any good relationship worth its weight takes time. And every relationship that's suffering is normally because we're not present to it. And the same is true for God. Now, the good news is he's consistent and he's near and he's pursuing you. Danielle and I, we have to choose to pursue each other. And Jesus is forming us and we're not perfect and we're being made in his image. But Jesus, man, he's present and he's there and he's waiting. We sang the song earlier. He's, he's this good shepherd that leads us. But he doesn't force us. He doesn't drive us. He leads us to steal water. He doesn't force us and dunk our head to make, a, make us take a drink. You guys with me? It's a relationship. So when you trust in Jesus, you receive the spirit of God. That check is written. But there's so much more to the relationship. There's so much to cash and be accessed. And this is where the Holy Spirit as a person is really important. Earlier I told you that the Spirit is not a power that we wield, but rather a person we're, we're in relationship with. You guys tracking with me on that? But I don't want you to miss the point that there is also power in that relationship. The difference is it's a person's power, not a force. So me and my buddy Seth, we, um, we go to the gym uh, every day of the week, and on Wednesday, it's leg day. Worst day, best day of my life. Every, it's awesome. Wednesday's leg day, we gotta show up. Listen, when you're as skinny as me, you gotta show up. Like, it's, it's a bad day for, like, leg days is hard when you got pencil legs. And so, we show up, and, we, you know, leg day, you gotta be careful. You gotta warm up well, really take care of yourself. You don't hurt yourself. And so, we've been, I mean, we've been doing it for a while now, and uh, uh, a couple of years, and so we go every week, and it's awesome, but then we warm up, right? Get everything loose and warmed up, and I'll start warming up with, like, 135, right? Just a good, nice warm up, get some deep squats in, and Seth rolls over there and he, he, he warms up with 225 and I'm like you suck like you why don't you just warm up with my max like why don't you just like I hate your guts I like your glutes but I hate your guts right like that's that's where I am so he's got some nice glutes I'm just saying right so he that's where he starts and and so by default Seth is a little shorter than me but he's more stocky and so he's definitely the dude I lean on when I got to lift something heavy you ever you know what I'm talking about like your good friends are the people that help you move furniture those guys. And so I want you to imagine, right, I mean, I mean I'm lifting a heavy couch or something, and, and I need to move the couch. I got two options. I can summon the power of Seth's glutes in that moment when I go to pick up that couch. Come on, Seth's glutes. Like, ah, oh, straight back, let's go. Seth's glutes, let's go. And I can work myself up into an emotional frenzy and summon the power of Seth's glutes. And that's what some people think a relationship with the Holy Spirit is like. Come on, you pray, 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 pray. Ask, 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 ask. Come on, come on, come on. Holy Spirit, power activate, right? <laughs> like, or I can call Seth <laughs> and he can come and he can lend me the power of his glutes real time and he can lift the couch. You know what's really cool is anytime Seth and I move something, he does about 95% of the lifting and I do about five, more of a management role, you know what I'm saying? And so we do that space and, and in a similar way, I lean on the relationship and I borrow Seth's power and together we move the couch. In the same way, a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit, who is in you. You don't work yourself up into an emotional frenzy and try really hard. You invite his person and his power and his presence to help. Jesus, I need to move this habit. Jesus, I need to move this addiction. Jesus, I need to move this obsession. Jesus, I need to change my loves and my longings. Jesus, I need help in my marriage. Jesus, I need help with my attitude. Jesus, I need help with my mental health. And the Holy Spirit meets us in that place as in a relationship. 
So as we grow in a relationship with the Holy Spirit, we also grow in experiencing his power in our lives. So listen to Jesus' words here in John 20. This is similar to the the Great Commission, Matthew 28. This is John's version of that post-resurrection, Jesus' last and final words with his followers. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus passing the baton of mission to his followers, to his apprentices, to make the love of God known in the world around him where people don't know him yet. And we at City Church, we spend a lot of time on mission. We exist to help people find their way to God from where they are. Rev Church exists for the mission of Jesus, to see disciples made. That's why you're here, but it's not the only thing. And and what happens sometimes is we get so laser focused on doing for Jesus what he says, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you, which is true. But if we miss the first and the last part, it gets us into trouble. Peace is where he starts. And some of you in the room, you need peace over your mind and over your heart and over the stage of life and over the season. And this is not just like an external peace that comes on that you have nothing to do with. This is also the development of emotional health. In the becoming of who you are, it's the hard work of cultivating emotional health. If you've never read the book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, I highly recommend you pick it up because it fills the gaps in some of that work. But then at the end, he says, receive the spirit. That is the presence of and power of God active within us. It's available, but that we lean on it. You see, if we focus on mission without the cultivation of emotional health, if we only serve in kids or the band or we build buildings and we do all of the stuff for Jesus as a church, If we focus on all of that without the cultivation of emotional health and the presence and power of God in our lives, it will lead to fatigue and it will lead to failure. I've heard it said burnout's a big word that comes up a lot in corporate circles as well as in the church. And I've heard it said that burnout is less of an issue connected to you and I doing too much. And it's more about you and I giving out of a place of emptiness. You have plenty to give if you're being filled up. But if you go to Jesus on Sunday, fill my bucket, and then all week you're pouring yourself out, eventually you're empty. But Jesus says, that's not how it works. This is a river of living water that never stops. And I wanna be with you every day. I wanna be with you on Sundays and in your quiet time on Mondays and on your lunch break and in that meeting with your boss and when you're with your kids because they're at home from school for all summer and they're driving you crazy. I'm with you in that. So I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't give them an out. He's not like, oh yeah, hey, take some emotional health time and don't live on mission. Go get your zen on and get some peace on before you live. No, it's all together, all at the same time. We say it this way at City Church. If you want to follow Jesus, it means three very simple things. Be with Jesus. It's relationship first. Intimacy with Jesus before activity for him. Be with Jesus. Become like Jesus. Do what Jesus did. All in the power of the Holy Spirit. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what he did. Listen to James as we end our time. James K.A. Smith says it this way, because we are what we want, our wants and our longings and desires are at the core of our identity, the wellspring from which our actions and behavior flow. Our wants reverberate from our heart, the epicenter of the human person. Thus the scripture counsels above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Discipleship, we might say, or apprenticing or following Jesus is a way to curate your heart, to be attentive to and intentional about what you love. Discipleship is more a matter of hungering and thirsting than of knowing and believing. Jesus' command to follow him is a command to align our loves and our longings with his, to want what God wants, desire what God desires, to hunger and thirst after God, and to crave a world where he is all in all, a vision encapsulated shorthand, in Jesus' words, the kingdom of God. So in Jesus' words, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. If you're thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. 
So I don't know where you are today. Following Jesus for a long time, brand new to following Jesus. Not sure where you stand with Jesus in the church. Maybe you've walked away from church and you're reconsidering faith, wrestling with some hard issues. Wherever you find yourself today, the invitation from Jesus is very, very simple. Number one, believe. Not cognitive rearrangement and go to heaven when you die. To put your trust and your weight in the person of Jesus, to lean on the reality of him being able to save you, forgive you of sin, make you new, fill you with the Holy Spirit, and help you on a journey of relationship of becoming who he created you to be, of adopting Jesus' vision of the good life over your life, not just asking what would Jesus would do, but what would Jesus do if he were me? That's the invitation. Not what would you do if you were Jesus, that's the wrong, that's the wrong question. What would Jesus do if he were me? If you've never believed in Jesus, the invitation is open today to repent and believe. Jesus said to repent, to change the way that we think, to agree with Jesus about reality and what it takes to have a relationship with God. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We don't maintain it. We don't work for it. We don't perform for it. We don't get ourselves behaviored up enough. We simply trust in Jesus that he died for us, was buried, rose again to save us, set us free, and give us new life. If you've never done that, that invitation is for you today. If you're following Jesus, the invitation is to come and to drink over and over again. Every moment of every day, the spiritual disciplines, large gatherings, small gatherings, one-on-one time, time in the scriptures, time in prayer, fasting, meditation, all of those things are access points into life with God. They're a means to an end. You don't read your Bible to get a check mark with Jesus. It's an access point into reality and relationship. The best part about following Jesus is Jesus. And it's on the table today. If you're thirsty, come and drink. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for our time. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that like in a relationship, it takes two people pursuing one another in order to cultivate that relationship. And thank you, God, that you have never stopped pursuing us. You were pursuing us before we ever even gave you a thought, before we ever even said yes to you. Some of my friends in the room, they're not followers of you. They never said yes to you, but they need to know today you love them and you have been pursuing them in their entire lives. And you've demonstrated that love by dying for them on the cross, being buried and rising again. For the, those of us in the room that are followers of Jesus, some of us are, are living in the middle of burnout because we keep giving, but we're not coming to you and you're pursuing us. God, would you cultivate a desire? Would we point our longings towards you? And would we be filled in such a way that there's no other thing that can quench the thirst like you can in the world around us? All of a sudden, we're more present to ourselves. We're more present to you and your activity throughout our day and your mission around us. We're more present to the people in front of us and those things in our pockets, those terrorists in our pockets, their voices are quieter and quieter and quieter as we are more alert and aware of what you're doing around us. And Jesus, I pray for this church as they press into you. I pray your kingdom would come, your will would be done over hearts, minds, individuals, families, relationships, children, schools, and this city. And your family would continue to grow and heaven would be more crowded because of this church. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give him a hand today. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It has been an honor. And I just want to close this time by saying, if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, or you're leaning in and you say, man, I want to follow Jesus and give him my life, I want to invite you to pray this prayer to give you confidence in that decision. So I'm going to invite everyone in the room to pray this prayer aloud with me. And if you're first time stepping into this and choosing to follow Jesus, we'll help you take some next steps. You guys ready? God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for doing life my way. Show me your way. Fill me with your spirit. Guide me by your word. Make me who you created me to be. Amen. Let's put our hands together for everyone that's making that decision for the first time. Listen, if you made that decision today, we are so excited for you. Heaven is rejoicing and so are we. We would love to help you take some next steps and know more fully what that decision looks like. You can text new me to the number on the screen. We would love to celebrate with you and follow up with you. On three, let's say goodbye to our online audience. One, two, three. Goodbye, friends. 